Hello, my name is Richard Stepp, Standard Plans Engineer with FDOT Central Office in Tallahassee. And welcome to the 2023 FDOT Design Manual Update Training for FDM 231 for Lighting. Today we'll be discussing some of the key revisions made for this FDM cycle. First up is the general section 231.1, where we're discussing light pole placement. And basically we want to reemphasize existing policy and clarify that light poles are to be located between the right-of-way line and the outside edge of curbs or shoulders. So essentially that means do not place light poles in the medians by default. The revision then further clarifies that light poles are only permitted in the median if lighting from the outside cannot meet the light level requirements. So you'd really want to place light poles in the medians as a last resort. And also, the pole, if it is placed in the median, has to be on or behind barriers per FDM 215.2.9. And also, I would just like to make a note that this was already the requirement per this section, FDM 215 and the standard plans instructions for index 715.001, but these revisions are now added for clarity in this new prominent location right at the start of chapter 231 for lighting. Next, we'll move to section 231.2, Design Criteria, where we've clarified the requirements for photometric design and the calculation method that should be used. For years, the FDM has explained to use the illuminance method instead of the luminance method, and so in the photometric design software, that translates to using the direct method for nighttime calculations. And that's shown here as it appears in the AGI32 design software. So again, with the illuminance method, service reflectivity does not need to be considered. And so basically we just want to keep it simple. Note that the direct only method is capable of supporting solid objects that may block the light, but this method does not require surface reflectivity because we know we have a wide range of different types of pavement on FDOT roadways. We just want to keep it simple. And staying with revisions for FDM 231.2 design criteria, we've updated some of the requirements for luminaire tilt. And now moving forward, the latest standard plans index 715001 for lighting has a new luminaire tilt detail to clear up any misconceptions for designers and contractors on exactly what this tilt angle means. Essentially, a zero degree baseline is considered level where the light projects directly downward towards the ground. The detail clarifies the axis of rotation and the way the luminaire tilt angles the light upwards, as can be seen here. And as part of these revisions, usage has been updated in the FDM. So moving forward, luminaires may be tilted up to the following. 5 degrees for limited access facilities, excluding undivided segments and ramps. And a higher tilt of 15 degrees for way stations, agriculture stations, and rest areas. And note that this generally only includes limited access facilities and their usual roadside areas. Luminaire tilt is not permitted on arterials and collectors. Continuing with FDM 231.2, some reorganization was done with new subsection headings added. And so this helps designers to more quickly find the information they're looking for, and it helps to better organize these ideas. So with this change, specific headings and guidance have been added for lighting values, which includes the table with the illumination values, limited access facilities and their unique requirements, interchanges, mounting heights, and color temperature, also known as CCT. So starting off, some policy clarifications were made under the lighting values heading. And the first of these is simply to say that the illumination levels shown in table 231.2.1 must be met or exceeded. So generally when design values are listed, it is implied that they are minimum values to be met, but we had received feedback from the districts that there was some questioning on the intention of these values. And so in order to clear up any confusion or discussion, we went ahead and explained that the values must be met or exceeded. Now, having said that, the new revision also quickly explains that once the listed value is met, the idea is to keep the light value as low as practical. And so there was also some feedback from the districts that designers would want to do the quickest job they can and maybe do one iteration in the design, which would result in significantly higher values than what are shown in the table. And so as a general rule, the values that are shown are the targets that we want to meet, but then stay pretty close to. The values shown are already fairly bright compared to national criteria, and they already include light loss factors. And so we do want to respect those calibrated values and not just add excessive brightness and glare out of convenience in the design phase. And so in order to make that general idea more objective, we've added maximums to the lighting values. Taking a quote directly from the new FDM, the average vertical foot candle illumination levels must not exceed the requirement shown by more than 10%. And so even when vertical foot candle requirements and horizontal foot candle requirements are shown, the vertical does tend to govern, particularly at intersections. So the first default requirement is to meet that vertical foot candle maximum and stay within 10% of the value shown in the table. Now the next requirement is for when the vertical foot candle is given as not applicable. 
So from the new FDM language, if the VFC requirement for a given location type is shown as NA, then the average horizontal foot candle requirement then governs and must not be exceeded by more than 10%. And so pretty straightforward, if the VFC is given as NA, the HFC then governs and it has the same 10% limitation. 10% is considered reasonable with getting us close to the target with only a few iterations, and this just objectively helps with keeping those brightness levels from becoming excessive. And next, we'll continue discussing lighting values, table 231.2.1. .2 and so here we're discussing side lighting values that have now been refined based on the Florida Turnpike Enterprise practice. And with the Turnpike's many, many lane miles of limited access facilities, they've really become the experts at lighting these roadside signs in many different conditions. And so here you can see we've now broken these down into three different categories, low ambient luminance, medium, and high ambient luminance. And to support this, note 3 was added to explain how low, medium, and high luminance classifications are defined. And so you could find that in the notes section at the bottom of the table. And the last important thing to note is that when considering sign lighting, you'd want to light signs only per FDM 230.2.4. And so that's where you'll find the usage thresholds. If it's determined that the sign lighting is not needed, it's assumed that the retroreflectivity of ASTM type 11 sheeting is sufficient per specification 994. So just be aware that not all signs automatically require lighting. Next, staying in section 231.2, we'll look under the heading of limited access facilities. Here we have a lighting requirement aimed at keeping the lighting more consistent on the roadways. And so we really want to avoid these little short segments where rapid eye adjustments are needed. We want to keep things more consistent for the eyes of the drivers. And so the quoted text from the FDM states that if the length of the mainline roadway between any two lighted areas is 0.5 miles or less, then that segment of the mainline must be lighted. And so this requirement comes at the request of the Turnpike Enterprise, given their great experience with limited access facilities. And the second part of the requirement stated is that these areas may include roadway mainline segments, interchanges, service plazas, and toll facilities. And so these areas require lighting of the mainline, and if you have a short roadway segment between these areas, then you'd want to add lighting. And so next in this section, we have the new heading of interchanges. And there are some new requirements associated with this. And so here we want to make it clear that for interchanges, high mass lighting values may be used throughout the interchange where adjacent connecting corridors are not lighted. So in the case where the interchange is lit independently, you can use those high mass lighting values throughout. And that typically happens in the more rural contexts. Now the next idea is that if a connecting corridor is lighted, then you'd continue those required lighting values for the corridor right through the interchange. And so if either the main line or the side street passes through the interchange and it has lighting, then you'd use those consistent lighting values through the interchange. And so this is a case where you'd want to plan ahead for future projects if possible. If you happen to know that corridor lighting is likely to be planned in that area, which is usually for larger roadways in the higher contexts, then it may be best to just go ahead and use those corridor values for lighting to begin with. And so the next idea is really just more of a clarification uh, for good engineering judgment, which basically states that for high mass lighting, the effects of elevated ramps and bridge decks must be accounted for in the design analysis, particularly when the light is blocked by raised objects. And so this can happen a lot, particularly with multi-level interchanges. You want to account for the adjacent bridges, railing, signs, or miscellaneous structures that may block the light. A simple 2D design just isn't going to be sufficient. And so now this language has been added to the FDM so that designers can't overlook these ideas. And then one more clarification that's particularly important in interchanges is to meet the maximum illumination and uniformity ratio requirements to avoid the bright spots. And so those uniformity ratios of table 231.2.1 are important. Last, conventional and high mass lighting may be used in conjunction to achieve the required illumination levels. And so particularly where structures are blocking the light from the high mass lighting, some conventional roadside lighting can be brought in to meet the requirements. So next up is the new mounting height heading, where it's clarified that mounting height is measured from the ground surface at the base of the pole to the bottom of the luminaire. So that'd be right here at the finish grade, up to the bottom of the light source. And then as guidance for the designer, the FDM says, in the photometric analysis, adjust the luminaire height to account for the difference between the finish grade elevation at the pole's base and the approximate average roadway surface elevation. So basically a mounting height in a table would again be from finish grade to the bottom of the luminaire, but for a photometric calculation, you'd adjust that luminaire height to an average of the roadway surface elevation out somewhere in the middle of the roadway. Now, in order to give some leeway and keep things simple, the FDM then states to assume a simplified level roadway, a surface elevation tolerance of plus or minus 18 inches is permitted in the analysis. 
and so that should help to account for most any cross slope without needing to model it in the photometric software. Our next FDM 231.2 topic heading is color temperature, where we have some new requirements. And so basically the FDM will now show the new color temperature policy that's been added as released in Roadway Design Bulletin 2202 back in March. And if you recall, we did some pretty extensive statewide reviews and discussions back then. And so the quick summary is that designers will now be assigning color temperature based on the roadway's design speed and context classification. A more thorough explanation of this topic is available as a short video training at this website, fdot.gov slash roadway slash training slash train web. And last, some new guidance has been added for the new daytime underdeck lighting policy per FDM 231.3.6. We'll discuss this in our upcoming slides, so stay tuned. Next up, at the request of the districts, we have a new section, 231.2.2, for light spill. And the first statement is fairly straightforward as far as engineering judgment goes, and that's simply to give attention to reducing light projection into surrounding areas. And so you can see picture that right, if you have light that's going to be projected into nearby living spaces or through nearby windows, that'd be considered light trespass, and that would be something to avoid wherever possible and practical. And so the first objective requirement states that if wildlife areas or residential properties are within 100 feet of the luminaire, then select the luminaire model with the manufacturer shielding options available for potential future install. And so note that when you're within that 100 foot threshold, light shielding is not automatically required, but you just want to make sure that options are available from the manufacturer should any issues arrive in the future. And this will help to keep future solutions a lot simpler and avoid the need for more costly custom shielding options. And then, of course, if you do happen to have a more severe case where you know it's likely to trigger a concern from the public, then you may immediately call for shielding in the plans. And so the case picture to the right does look like it would fall under that category. And last, the idea is to keep this as simple as possible, but we do want to ensure there is some documentation on the subject. So reading the direct quote from the new FDM revision, provide a general overview of the light spill status to coordinate mitigation decisions with the district design office, provide a brief summary of these coordination efforts, including the participants and results in the LDAR per FDM 231.7. And this summary can be something as simple as an email exchange where the decisions regarding the light spill are shared. And for many projects, it's likely that no action will be needed. Next is section 231.3, design methodology, where it's better to find where a new lighting design analysis is needed. And so right up front, the FDM states a lighting design analysis is required where a new system of luminaires is being installed or where luminaire locations are being changed within an existing system. The FDM goes on to give examples to help clear up any misconceptions, especially when it comes to maintenance lamp replacements. So from the FDM, for example, a lighting design analysis is required for intersection lighting retrofits, which typically involves adding all new LED light fixtures and adding some new poles, the general adding or moving of light poles, and the replacement of more than three consecutive luminaires on existing light pole runs for maintenance or other purposes. And this is to prevent cases where very lengthy runs full of existing high-pressure sodium luminaires are switched to LED luminaires with no design analysis. This should not be occurring because we know that LEDs perform very differently from high pressure sodium in terms of their light projection. And we also know that LED fixtures may last in the field up to three times longer than the old high pressure sodium. So for new systems of lights that are gonna be installed for this very long period of time, we certainly wanna see that a lighting design analysis is completed. And this helps to ensure a safe design with the proper light uniformity and the avoidance of bright and dark spots. It also always helps to check lengthy runs of LED lights for glare requirements as well. And next, we're still in section 231.3, where we're switching gears to focus on some clarifications to roadway and sign lighting calculation formatting. And so please just be aware when it comes time to do the new calculations, the FDM has new information provided for the output sheet size, data grid point patterns, foot candle accuracy of the data points, and the needs for a 3D model if bridges or solid objects block the light. And then moving down the line to section 231.3.1, the FDM will now assist with more detailed information on the analysis zones for underdecks, interchanges, and rest areas. And so with that, please know that new comprehensive information is provided for the lateral or side-to-side -side bounds of the analysis zones and the longitudinal limits of the analysis zones. And this now includes information on the interchange crossroads. So it's hoped that this will help to avoid any second guessing in the design process, particularly for these more complex locations of under decks, interchanges, and rust areas. And moving along to section 231.3.4 for mid-block crosswalks, we've offered a small clarification for standalone crosswalks. 
And so basically, mid-block crosswalk criteria applies to marked crosswalks at all locations that are not at intersections. So the crosswalk does not have to be in the middle of a block for this policy to apply. For example, mid-block crosswalk criteria applies to crosswalks on exit or entrance ramps. Next, moving on to section 231.3.6 for bridge under deck lighting, additional options have been added for mounting locations. Previously, the FDM limited the mounting of luminaires to the pier or the pier cap. But moving forward, the FDM now says the permitted locations for mounting luminaires are on the bridge substructure, including piers, caps, end vents, and wall coping. And so a couple more common mounting locations were added as the result of working with the districts on many different projects and seeing what's practical. And next up is the largest addition for this cycle. It's an all new section 231.3.6.2 for daytime under deck lighting. And so the FDM will now offer new guidance and policy for the rare design cases where long underpasses resemble tunnels, particularly from a lighting standpoint during the day. So this occurs when an exceptionally long overpass begins to block the sunlight from reaching the roadway below. And so that large contrast between the bright daylight and the darkness underneath may create visibility issues for drivers when their eyes simply cannot adjust fast enough. Pictured at right, you can see an example from a construction project where daytime underdeck lighting has not yet been added. And as the driver approaches, this creates something that's known as the black hole effect, where the visibility of what's beyond this entrance threshold is greatly reduced. And so daytime underdeck lighting greatly increases that visibility by mimicking daylight underneath that underpass. And it should be noted that this type of daylight lighting is significantly brighter than nighttime lighting. So it does require specialized design with special transitions. And so the good news is that this new design policy is only for the rare design cases that would warrant such lighting. Where needed, this is a complex design process following the national guidance of ANSI IES RP2211. And so for daytime underdeck lighting, the new FDM revision provides underpass link thresholds for daytime lighting. And this is the part that exempts most underpasses from this analysis as we'll discuss in a moment. Streamline guidance for the applicable ANSI IES RP2211 processes. It's noted that this national guidance is very, very lengthy and detailed, and so this new guidance helps designers save time by only focusing on the practical portions of the design that are needed by FDOT. Also, helpful design assumptions are given in the FDM, such as analysis times and surface reflectivity for the components under the bridge. And last, lighting plans requirements are given for these unique cases. And it's important to remember that these unique cases are complex, and the analysis does involve 3D model luminance design. It is considerably more complex than your typical nighttime illumination designed for roadways, so you may want to consider seeking out expert consultants for these rare cases. It is known that some tunnel lighting companies provide their own design services for the installation of their own products, which are also adjustable in the field. And last, we'll talk about the thresholds for daytime underdeck lighting and when it's required. And so the vast majority of underpasses will not require this extensive analysis that we've just discussed. For underpasses 80 feet and less, no special daytime consideration is needed. For underpasses greater than 80 feet, but less than or equal to 150 feet, you design and install nighttime underdeck lighting, and then it's just run continuously throughout the day. So no special daytime analysis is needed for bridges less than or equal to 150 feet. That said, if an underpass is greater than 150 feet, the more complex analysis is needed. You then begin following the ANSI IES RP2211. And so moving forward, if you have these significant projects and these substantial underpasses, please keep these link thresholds in mind and follow the FDM procedure where it's needed. And last, taking a look at section 231.7 for the Lighting Design Analysis Report, or LDAR, some clarifications were made to help summarize the inclusions that are needed. First, the photometric analysis of all areas and segments, where we now reference the appropriate FDM sections for the results and formatting details. The luminaire cost-effective statement, which is basically why the designer explains why the design luminaire was chosen and placed in the contract plans. The voltage drop calculations are needed. Lighting agency coordination document. FAA coordination documents where applicable. And the new light spill coordination summary. And with that, we've reached the end of our 2023 design manual update training for chapter 231 for lighting. Thank you for your time and attention.